scientists don't question this. Mm -hmm. Like, why am I using this criterion? Why do I rely so much on this sense of beauty if there is no reason to think that it actually tells me something about what I'm trying to achieve? Have you ever seen these pictures where they take like Brad Pitt, uh, you know, who's the handsomest man in, in, in the world, according to the reputable science journal called People magazine here in America, or OK. And they take his face <clears throat> and they split it in half and then they mirror reflect you know, one half onto the other. So it's perfectly symmetrical, at least, you know, parody symmetrical. And he looks grotesque. And, you know, this is the most attractive man in the world. So it started making me think that is it really true that that, you know, great beauty is truly symmetric or is it just a cop out or is it just a shortcut a mental hack to use symmetry to avoid doing things in other words is physics actually more symmetric than than even uh, art is well symmetry is not the only kind of beauty of course um, so i think the reason uh, even the the uh, supposedly most beautiful man looks uh, terrible if you do that kind of thing is that we realize immediately it's unnatural. Um, so it just freaks us out, right? So, so this is not a, a real human being. I, I think that's where it comes from psychologically. Uh, but I mean, it is well established that um, our sense for symmetry very, very likely has an evolutionary um, origin you know, we, we, we like things that are symmetrical because in many instances, symmetry is a sign of health. Um, so it makes sense um, that we like it, but uh, does it make any sense that we expect nature on the most fundamental level um, to appeal to this very sense of beauty that we take from apples, basically, mm. <laughs> right? Uh, mm -hmm. And so this is what leaves me perplexed, that um, scientists don't question this. Mm. Like, why, why am I using this criterion? Why do I rely so much on this sense of beauty if there is no reason to think that it actually tells me something about what I'm trying to achieve, uh, in this case, um, trying to understand, I don't know, the, the quantum nature of space and time or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so in, in the foundations of physics, uh, we have this, this very peculiar problem that um, arguments from beauty have become very commonplace and um, very few people question it. It's just because everyone is doing it, uh, it, it seems to have become okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I wonder, you know, if I'm trying to show a picture of me with <clears throat> someone named Max Tegmark at uh, MIT when we... Okay, but it's, it's cut, without the heads. <laughs> yeah, no heads. So they're, you know, he's extremely attractive, even when you cut off his head, apparently. Uh, <laughs> so I'll switch back to your cover. Um, so we, we talk about um, physicists and especially theoreticians. I have yet to really see an experimentalist focus on beauty as a criterion, although I do want to get into that uh, for a bit because, and, and you and I met again uh, about a year and a half ago in Los Angeles talking about your book in front of other, you know, basically all theoretical physicists except for me or mathematicians, <clears throat> including Eric Weinstein, Stefan Alexander, and, and uh, Priya Naratajan and, and others. And the question was, you know, what, what is about, what is it about this, the topics and the and kind of issues raised in at least what I call the polemical. Your book is really divided in at least two parts. One is a polemic about this very issue and the perniciousness that it may prove to be for physics and progress in the 21st century. But it's also this travel log and this you know heroine's journey around the planet, literally. Uh, and there's so many delightful scenes in there. But um, but I tried to make the point in that gathering of you know brainiacs that you know beauty is essential or you know to an experiment like there there are experiments which aren't beautiful but but experiment you know like the transistor if you've ever seen the first transistor you know it's a, a piece of chewing gum over here a crystal there and a, and a coat hanger there and it magically works so i mean it's beautiful judged by its results but for example when i we just put out a paper on the polar bear team which i'm a part of um, which is a cosmic microwave background polarization experiment who has an ultimate goal uh, to measure and constrain uh, the existence or lack thereof of primordial uh, perturbations in the metric of space time, potentially caused by gravitational waves, potentially the byproduct of inflation, 
which is potentially a harbinger of the multiverse. So you have all these different chains and we'll get into each one of those. And I, I know your feelings are very well known on those, but I want to recapitulate them to the audience. So now I have this experiment and along the way, we can't, we spent uh, six months with a graduate student working on this to be precise and her advisors, you know, they spent six to nine months looking for departures from symmetry. In other words, we're doing null tests. We're doing, we're trying to torture the data in as many ways as possible that should yield a zero signal. Uh, and yet every time we do that, we find there are some departures for that. And that's a form of symmetry. Would, would you agree? Sure, there are many forms of symmetry. So uh, let me maybe be a little bit more precise uh, mm -hmm. what, what the problem is with these arguments from beauty. It's not that per se that uh, physicists like to talk about beauty because uh, as you say, you know, uh, experimentalists talk about beauty uh, and I don't think that's necessarily a problem. Mm -hmm. um, it becomes a problem if um, a large community has a very narrow sense of beauty and uh, that becomes uh, an entrenched methodology that they are not willing to give up on, even though it's clearly not working. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I have no problem uh, with, with people who um, value beauty uh, in, in mathematics or in their work in general. Um, it becomes a problem if it's, it's, a, if it's a dogmatic um, a trend in the community. And maybe I should add there that um, I guess a lot of theoretical physicists uh, uh, would be um, insulted uh, that I talk about um, beauty and accuse them of using uh, notions of beauty um, because they, uh, by and large, don't understand what they are doing. Mm. So um, I, I was in a debate just on, on the weekend with um, Jim Baggett, and um, he says he prefers to call it metaphysical commitment. Mm. And uh, th that's entirely right. That's what it is. It's a metaphysical commitment. They have certain ideas of how their theories are supposed to look like that are not themselves um, scientific, but they use them nevertheless. Mm. Now, why don't I call it metaphysical commitment? Uh, because you can't put that on the cover of a book, <laughs> basically. Uh, so this is why I talk about beauty. I also think that historically, it's actually where it came from. You know, it was this sense of beauty that people uh, like to talk about. But now they're using notions of beauty, like this uh, idea of technical naturalness that you have in high energy physics, um, that are just mathematical criteria. And they don't uh, understand that these are actually metaphysical commitments. 